we said that the humanist scholars of the Renaissance studied classical literature and history and philosophy and looked at classical art. And we said that classical art, the art of ancient Greece and Rome, uh, inspired Renaissance artists. So I thought I should show you some classical art. How was classical art known to the Renaissance? Well, sometimes only through description. For example, they might read Lucian and read um, about the artist Apelles and his description of the painting known as the Calamy of Apelles. And then certain Renaissance artists, Montaigne and Botticelli, each created their own Calamy of Apelles from that description. Uh, actually, Lucian was one of the first Greek writers that was translated into Latin. And the description of that painting uh, was part of Alberti's book on painting. And since that book was translated into Italian, artists who didn't read Latin and certainly didn't read Greek would know what it looked like. Other authors, such as Pliny and Pisanius, also described work of art. They essentially are doing, um, Pliny does a natural history, but he's, he's not just talking about what we would call natural history, but he talks about all these things in the world, uh, including man-made objects such as artwork. And Pisanius does a, essentially a travel guide, a description of Greece. Uh, so they're describing famous works of art. And frankly, the famous works of art from ancient Rome and Greece have almost all perished. You can't go and see Phidias's statue of Athena anymore. You'll have to be content with the uh, imagined reproduction in the Parthenon in Nashville. Uh, you can't see uh, some of these very famous works of art, they don't exist. But the Romans took over not only the Greek religion, uh, but they also were inspired by Greek art. And so the Romans made copies of Greek original statues. If you were rich Roman and you wanted to have Polyclitus's spear carrier in your atrium, well, there was only one. But Roman artisans turned out copies of them, of which I think three, maybe four, survive today. Uh, so we don't have the original spear carrier by the Greek artist Polyclites, but we do have Roman copies. We also have the Romans creating their own artwork, which follows the Greek style, uh, sometimes very idealistic and sometimes more the Hellenistic style where it becomes even more naturalistic. So what did Renaissance artists know? Sometimes they knew about the literary descriptions from ancient Rome and Greece. And sometimes they knew Roman artwork. And sometimes, even if they hadn't seen it, uh, there might have been drawings that circulated, or in some cases, prints. Now, what are the characteristics of classical sculpture, which we then see in Renaissance art? Most classical sculpture that we think of is the human figure. And that, of course, we say, the human figure is the subject of Renaissance art. They usually have these ideal proportions based on mathematical ratios. And indeed, the, the idea of these ideal proportions comes out of ancient Greece and out of ancient Rome and informs the Renaissance. The style was either idealism or naturalism. And the classical 
artists, and you know, we have very small survival of classical painting, to be perfectly frank. And the Renaissance had almost none. Um, Pompeii and Herculaneum had not been discovered. Um, there were some excavations in Nero's golden house, and you had to sort of uh, crawl down into the tunnels to look at what essentially were decorative um, frescoes. You know, not a lot of scenic uh, things with the, the figures. Um, so most of what they were looking at was sculpture. And the classical sculptors had to know anatomy. Uh, most of the classical deities and athletes uh, were shown in the nude or near nude, or they might be shown with draperies, but the draperies would cling to the body and reveal the body. To make these images look lifelike, they had to stand with, say, the weight on one leg, uh, sort of the, that uh, natural twist to the body that we call contra hosto, and we'll talk more about that later when we look at Renaissance uh, art uh, in Italy. Now, I wanted to show you uh, some of the works of art that were known in the Renaissance. Uh, and this one is called the Apollo Belvedere, or the Apollo Belvedere. Uh, it's in Rome. And uh, when it was discovered, uh, was, you know, dug up in the late 15th century, this was considered to be the epitome of masculine beauty. And there were drawings made, there were engravings made, and it influenced art. And another work that we'll also see later on uh, influencing art uh, was the Medici Venus. It's called that because it was in the collection of the Medici, uh, elite, the leading family in Florence, Italy. And uh, today it's in the Uffizi Gallery. Uh, and this is a Roman image of Venus, uh, known as the modest Venus. As you can see, she's partially uh, covering up her genitalia and uh, partially covering her breast. And this was considered to be, you know, this beautiful example of feminine beauty. Now, this was a picture that I took of a sarcophagus uh, in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. And I thought, oh my goodness, this shows so many of the characteristics that we see in Renaissance art. You can see nude figures with the weight on one leg, uh, emphasizing the musculature. And then look at some of those female figures where you have the draperies that flutter around. Uh, they cling to the leg. One of them, uh, the leg sticks out and on the other leg, the drapery is clinging to it. So you can clearly see the thigh and the knee and the, the shin. Uh, and then you can see these curving uh, windblown drapery that swirls up in a circle behind the figure. And uh, you'll see things like that in uh, Renaissance art. And one last work of art I want to show you. This was discovered in the early 16th century. Uh, and it's known as the Lawakawan because that's the name of the, the man who's shown there. He was a priest of Troy. And when the Greeks um, built the Trojan horse, and you probably know the story. Uh, the Greeks had been battling the Trojans for 11 years and were not able to defeat them. So they came up with a stratagem. Uh, they built this giant wooden horse. And the soldiers, the Greek soldiers, with all their armaments, went inside the horse. It was hollow. And left just one man out on the beach and they sailed their ships away, and I guess they had enough uh, people to sail the ships away so they uh, couldn't be seen from Troy. And um, he told this fantastic story about how the Greeks had given up and left, and the gods had left this great uh, uh, wooden horse, uh, you know, to, to the Trojans. And the Trojans decided they'd bring the horse inside Troy, but Laocoon the priest said, no, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. Don't believe that Greek. 
Well, you may know that during the Trojan War, the gods themselves sided either with Greece or with Troy. And so some of the gods were siding with the Greeks and they wanted the Trojans to be defeated. And one of them was Poseidon, the god of the sea. His Roman name is Neptune. And Poseidon sent sea serpents, sent snakes from the sea to come and crush and strangle Laocoon and his sons to death. And when the Trojans saw that, they said, oh, he must have been punished by the gods for not speaking the truth. Actually, he was punished by the gods for speaking the truth. But the Trojans were deceived and the Trojans took the horse into the city of Troy. And during the night, the Greeks came out of the horse and slaughtered the Trojans. And of course, defeated the Trojans. Um, and that, of course, was the end of the Trojan War. So here we have the statue of the Loachuan. That's the name of the priest. And you see him tormented and twisting uh, with all of these serpents surrounding him and his two sons smaller beside him. Uh, as you can see, the, the anatomy is um, you know, well understood. Uh, you can see certainly the, all the, the muscles of the body as they strain. This you know, was seen as one of these extremely dramatic statues. And indeed, uh, one of the first persons to see it was Michelangelo, and he was commissioned uh, to finish it up. As you can see, the hands were broken off. Sometimes you will see photographs of this in which the hands are still on it. Well, those aren't the original hands from uh, ancient Rome. Uh, those are the hands that Michelangelo added to this statue. And, you know, it's certainly a, an inspiration to him uh, because he loved to show heavily muscled figures uh, that can twist and turn uh, and show emotion. It's, it's a good example of the movements of the mind. We have, you know, this perfect musculature, but we also have the suffering and the agony as, as the Loacon cries out. So we're seeing, uh, you know, the, the beauty of the body, the anatomy, and the very movements of the mind in this work.